event coordinator, and welcome to Terrorism Movement Inc.'s eighth annual workshop on geoethical nanotechnology. Please allow me a few moments to go over the tips and hints that appear on the right screen. Only the presenter will be advancing the slides on the presentation screens, so please resist uh, uh, advancing the slides. Unless you are the presenter, please do not engage your speaker or voice chat control during the workshop. Only the speaker should have the voice control active. A Q&A session will follow each presentation. Questions are limited to the text box found in the lower left toolbar. The presenter will address only those questions appearing within the chat history box. A moderator may assist to ensure, if time permits, that all questions are addressed by the presenters. Presenters, please make certain your cell phones or other signal emitting devices are either turned off or sufficiently away from your computer during the time your microphone is engaged. Failing to do so could cause interference with your audio. And to everyone, please keep in mind that these proceedings are being recorded. Thank you all, and I'm wishing everyone a wonderful workshop experience. Now, please allow me to introduce our moderator and our host, Dr. Martine Rothblatt, a.k.a. InWorld Vitology Destiny. Martine is the president and co-founder of Terrace Movement, Inc. Let's all please welcome Martine. Thank you, Lori, for that uh, warm introduction. I, um, I just feel so fortunate to have you in charge of um, organizing this conference and just doing such a great job with all of the organizations. So um, I'd like to point out to everybody the um, screens up front. Um, I have a few convening slides that I'd like to show, and I um, thank Lori Darling for um, organizing these convening slides and um, getting them up here and, and presenting them. So the first um, question I'd like to ask is, why do we even have these workshops on geoethical nanotechnology why on July 20th, and um, why by TerraSEM? Uh, next slide, please, Lori Darling. So as most of us know, July 20th is when um, we first landed on the moon in 1969. And um, now um, we are 43 years after that. And um, that is such a momentous event that um, we like to continue celebrating it. In terms of um, why geoethical nanotechnology, uh, technology has two faces, uh, friendly and not so friendly. Next slide. Um, it is very uh, helpful to have technology. It really has um, made civilization worthwhile for us and um, been very beneficial for the vast majority of people. Um, but um, sometimes it causes problems. And um, next slide, please. These are examples of some of the problems. Next slide. Next, there we go. So, one way is to avoid the problems are to have rules. Here there are rules on how to handle fire, and the rules um, allow us to have the benefit of the technology while minimizing the risks. Next slide. Um, we have rules governing activities in space. It's called the law of outer space. And thus, instead of getting a war in space, we've had a peaceful development of outer space. Next slide. Um, we have uh, numerous countries cooperating on the International Space Station instead of um, 
thermonuclear explosions in space. That's because we have uh, geoethically managed the development of near-Earth space. Next slide. Um, the key words in the Outer Space Treaty are to have uh, due regard for the interests of all others. That's the key principle of geoethics. Whatever you do, have due interest for the uh, due regard for the interests of all others who might be affected by your activities. Next slide. So my hope is that this conference um, will similarly uh, result in us being able to deploy nanotechnology in a way that um, has due regard for the interests of all others who would be affected by it. That's what we mean by geoethical nanotechnology. That's what we've been pursuing for the past eight years and will continue to pursue um, until we really see that we have helped birth um, self-replicating nanotechnology into a realm of uh, geoethical um, considerations. Next slide. Uh, TerraSim is the host of the conference because the uh, TerraSim movement's fundamental goal is to get life um, off of this planet and spread it throughout the galaxy. To do that a way that um, celebrates diversity but keeps everybody working united toward the same goal rather than fighting with each other. And we believe geoethical nanotechnology is essential to spreading civilization throughout the galaxy. Next slide. And here you see the uh, basic principles of uh, geoethical nanotechnology. We'll talk about those more as the symposium proceeds this afternoon or this morning, depending where you are. Next slide. And now it is time for me to introduce our um, first speaker. It's uh, Peter Wicks, who is currently on sabbatical from Science and Environment Policy Interface at the European Commission under which uh, Peter has served from 1996 to 2011. Though from England, Peter leaves, lives and works in Brussels. His interests are hosting a forum entitled The Future of Humanity. Um, he is also very interested in the European Foresight Platform and in the Institute for the um, for um, Emerging and Evolving Technology uh, for the Evolution of Emerging Technology, IWET. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Peter as he presents for us on the title of Technology and the, and the Environment, Enemies or Allies. Peter, please join me at the podium. Well, thank you very much, uh, Martin, and uh, thank you to uh, Laurie, especially for um, helping me. Um, three years ago, I did not have an internet connection um, at home. Uh, one week ago, I didn't have a Second Life uh, avatar. So this is all um, very new for me and, uh, and also very exciting. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, about the relationship between um, nanotechnology um, and emerging technologies more generally um, and the environment and in particular about the community of people with, that we tend to call environmentalists whether people working in government whether NGOs whether simply concerned citizens who are worried about the environment and what I want to get at is the extent to which um, there can be a, a community of interest between um, those who see the benefits of technology and those who want to protect the environment, or whether 
um, these will always be tend to be seen as opposed. Um, now, uh, has my second, oh, there we go. Um, what you see on this slide um, is a press release from uh, Greenpeace. Uh, I'm sure you all know um, Greenpeace. It's maybe the, the most famous environmental NGO in the world. Um, in this press release, which um, they released last October, um, they welcomed a decision of the European Court of Justice, which is somewhat analogous to the Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court here in Europe, um, who had upheld Greenpeace's challenge um, concerning the patentability of stem cell research. Um, and as you can see, the, um, the press release reads as follows. Greenpeace welcomes the decision that cells derived from human embryos cannot be patented as patents on such cells would encourage the commercialization of human em embryos. Now, if you are like me, I, I was working in the environmental um, department of the European Commission at the time. And when I saw this, my first question was, what does that have to do with the environment? Um, they seemed to be worried about commercialization of human embryos. They seem to worry, be worried about ethics, about um, people playing God, all the kind of concerns that you hear from so many people. But what was the environmental dimension? What was an environmental NGO doing um, trying to block um, the, uh, the patent of, um, of stem cell research. Um, just as a little bit more background information on that case, it was an, actually a case that they brought in Germany, and it was the German courts that referred to the case to the European court. Um, now, while I was preparing this uh, presentation, I was eager to see what uh, environmental NGOs are currently saying about nanotechnology. And I dug out this from the um, Environmental Defense Fund, which is, I would guess, the, the main NGO in the US uh, on the environment. And well, I'll, I'll read out exactly what they said. Um, nanotechnology has great potential to de deliver environmental and other benefits but it may also pose significant risks to human health and the environment. And they go on to say that government and industry should work to identify and manage possible health risks before new products are widely used. Now, clearly, um, this particular NGO is paying at least lip service to the fact that nanotechnology has potentially enormous benefits, although you may notice that they don't actually use the word enormous. Um, but I think you'll probably agree with me in saying that the emphasis here is very much on risk. Um, environmental NGOs seem to see more risks than opportunities in nanotechnology. Um, not only to the environment, but also to human health. Um, and they, um, they propose um, a collaboration between government and industry uh, to manage those risks before products are widely used. So they really want to um, slow down the commercialization of nanotechnology in order to deal with the risks. Now, I Assume there is nobody um, in the audience today who would disagree that there are risks as well as opportunities involved in emerging technologies, including nanotechnology. But still, the question in my mind um, that has been brewing in my mind for the 16 years that I worked in the Environment Department at the Commission, the European Commission, was why is the 
emphasis of environmentalists so much on risks when it comes to new technology and rarely more than lip service paid to the potential benefits. And this is the main question I want to try to answer today um, and to come up with some reflections on uh, what those of us who tend to see benefits more than opportunities might do to close the gap between um, the techno-progressive community and the environmental community. So I'm now going to try to uh, advance the slide. There we go. So the basic answer to the question that um, I want to explore today is a historical one. Um, I believe that the, um, the relatively hostile attitude towards technology of many uh, people who are uh, concerned about the environment um, has its roots in the origins of the environmental movement. Um, and as you can see from this slide, um, and you can see from Wikipedia, you can, you can see very easily from the internet, um, the roots of the environmental movement are very much in um, the 19th century and in the Industrial Revolution as a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. Um, you've probably heard of the term Luddites. Um, these were the people that actually vandalized um, the new industries that were springing up um, in England and Germany as a result of the Industrial Revolution um, because they felt with some reason um, that industry was um, spoiling the environment and ruining living conditions for many people. Um, and it was. Uh, the, the fact is that there was a lot of hardship and a lot of environmental degradation um, caused by um, the industrial development of the time. Now, if we um, fast forward um, through the First and Second World War, when, when it's probably fair to say that people's minds were on other things, um, we see further developments in environmental consciousness um, which, as you can see, um, remains very much associated with technological risks. There was the nuclear testing um, in the Bikini Atoll, um, which um, made people start to be aware of the environmental and health risks, um, not only of nuclear weapons that had been developed with such catastrophic results in the Second World War, but um, people thought even more generally. Then there was the iconic book, uh, Silent Spring, uh, which um, was particularly concerned about the chemical industry and how um, chemicals that were being released into the environment um, as a result of industrial development um, could even lead to the destruction of nature, the silent spring being a spring where there are no birds left to welcome the spring. And then the Torrey Canyon as an example of um, accidents and disasters that have uh, to this day continued to mar um, the development of industry um, and associate it with environmental degradation. Now, at this stage, um, environmental awareness was still something of a fringe movement. It wasn't really mainstreamed um, into the language of politicians. Um, it wasn't a very big scientific focus. Um, it hadn't found its way uh, to a great extent into legislation or to really popular um, consciousness. That started to change um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, the Club of Rome is an example of a development which brought together uh, politicians and scientists to, to start taking um, a really close look um, at the environment. But it was always 
still with the idea that it was basically industrial development and new technologies that posed the greatest threat to the environment. Um, it was as if every new technology that came along posed a new threat um, to the environment. And indeed, um, during the 80s, um, we started to become aware of new risks, um, not just the air and water pollution that we had been aware of before, um, but things like depletion of the ozone layer, um, acid rain, um, and of course, what everybody talks about today, um, climate change. And then finally, as um, technological development started to um, accelerate, um, and genetic engineering, genetically modified organisms, um, started to be developed and commercialized, um, there was a huge backlash um, which is, I would say, even stronger in, the, in Europe than it is in the US. Um, and environmental NGOs were very much in the vanguard of opposing such development. Um, the word that they like to use for this is frankenfood. I just need to... Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. So, so that, that's, for me, the main reason why um, the environmental community um, tends to be um, rather hostile to technological development. It has its roots in a movement that was created in reaction to the Industrial Revolution. What is interesting, though, and in some respects more positive, um, is that as the environmental um, as the environmental movement has matured, um, one starts to see contradictions. Um, and one of the biggest debates within the environmental community is whether the idea is to um, value nature for its own sake. Um, or whether we should be trying to aim uh, to create a healthy environment for humans. Um, they don't even talk about post-humans. Most environmentalists have no idea um, what that even means. But they at least um, debate, are we talking about nature for its own sake or a healthy environment for humans? And depending on which um, side of the debate they're on, they will either tend to see humans, homo sapiens, as something like the pinnacle of creation, that is to say the traditional Abrahamic way in which um, uh, certainly Western culture has tended to uh, um, see ourselves and our relationship with the rest of the planet. Or they go to the other extreme and see Homo sapiens um, as a kind of cancer on the face of the planet, something very um, destructive um, and uh, something that nature would be better off without, rather tending to forget that um, nature actually created us. Um, you can probably tell which side of that debate I'm on, but the important point is that um, there is that debate going on within the environmental community. And over the last two or three years, as climate change has come into focus as the main environmental topic of uh, political and public attention, um, an environmental community that has traditionally been entirely against nuclear power, partly because um, they sometimes don't really make the distinction between nuclear power and, and nuclear war. Um, and of course, because of events like um, uh, nuclear accidents like uh, uh, Fukushima and so on, um, they have started actually to debate whether after all they should be less negative about nuclear power because at least it's uh, carbon neutral. 
Um, so again, one of the questions being asked, is nuclear power a solution to global warning, warming, or is it some kind of deadly avatar of Armageddon? I wanted to put in the word avatar in at least uh, once in my presentation. You may be surprised by the next point, um, because you might think that wind farms would be um, absolutely um, loved by all environmentalists. But one of the most famous um, environmentalists, James Lovelock, for example, has lobbied against um, a wind farm in his native part of England because he thinks it spoils the countryside. And other people have uh, complained that um, birds have a tendency to fly into the wind turbines and it's therefore bad for the local environment. So even something as apparently benign as, and as environmentally friendly as wind farms are seen as vandalism by some within the um, environmental community. So if we take these very various debates together, um, then what we can see is um, a question mark within the environmental community, which is very much um, reflected in the de debates that I participated in um, in the European Commission, even amongst environmentalists, whether we should see technology primarily as a friend or primarily as a foe. Okay, I'm just, uh, Laurie, if you could just help me to, okay, I've got it. No, I've... Okay, so, okay, th this slide was just to um, give an example of how some environmentalists um, take a refreshingly positive attitude towards technology. Um, and this is from the WWF, which um, certainly where I worked in the Commission was seen as one of the more responsible and moderate environmental NGOs. And it's just a little anecdote here to show um, that the WWF um, was supporting um, a, an example of new technology um, that was using solar power um, to run a boat that runs entirely on, on solar energy, um, which recently visited the Galapagos Islands. And this is this I just got from their website, um, but it, it, it shows that the environmental community is not monolithically opposed um, to technology, um, but there are some signs of hope that it can take a more balanced um, attitude. Um, so the question that I um, want to um, explore now, and which I will be very happy to um, discuss in, in the Q&A and uh, in the informal interactions later, um, is what this might mean for the kind of positions that uh, people who, as I say, tend to see the advantages more uh, than the risks involved in emerging technologies, including nanotechnology, what kind of stance we should be taking um, when we think about environmental issues um, and when we talk uh, with people who are concerned about the environment, uh, many of whom are likely to be um, very skeptical about uh, new technology. And I, the first thing that came to my mind when I asked myself this question um, was um, that concern for the environment needs to respect human aspirations. Um, this is a debate that I've actually been having recently on Facebook and in and face to face with um, some of my former colleagues. Um, who have been rather um, on the line that the planet would be better off um, 
uh, without human beings. And well, perhaps it's okay to breathe, but that's about all we should be doing. Um, we should be taking care to reduce our environmental footprint. Um, and that tends to be very much the focus. And my problem with that is that it just doesn't respect human aspirations. Um, the fact is that human beings um, want to uh, do great things. They want to um, feed their families. They want to have exciting jobs. They want to travel. Um, they want to explore new horizons. And an environmentalism that doesn't respect um, those human aspirations um, will not engage um, the kind of um, inspiration and creativity that we actually need um, either to deal with our environmental problems um, or um, indeed to do all the other things that we want to do. On the other hand, um, in case we are tempted to um, feel superior to um, environmentalists that are rather skeptical of technology and tend to see it more as a risk than an opportunity, um, we do need to um, respect and understand that technology also has its negative aspects. Um, it has done harm as well as good. Um, it is potentially very disruptive. Um, some people benefit from it much more than others. Um, for many people on this planet, it probably would have been better if we hadn't developed technology. Um, there is a case to be made uh, that, that technology um, does harm as well as good. A related point, but which is nevertheless slightly different, um, is that sometimes um, people's opposition to new technology um, is um, simply a result of fear of change. And it's easy to, again, feel rather superior to people who are opposed um, to technology essentially because they're scared. Of course, um, nobody wants to admit that they're scared. Um, but first of all, we need to understand that that fear is real. It exists. Um, and it, they don't disappear just by saying that people shouldn't be scared. And to some extent, it's also legitimate. People are not obliged to want to live in the very weird future um, that um, is being created by accelerating technology. So fear of change is a, a legitimate um, concern. Um, another thing that we need to understand and apply to ourselves as much as to anybody else is that human beings are not rational and we cannot expect human beings to be rational. Um, so people will be scared. They will try to justify their um, fears um, by exaggerating risks, by um, inventing risks that aren't really there. Um, uh, or simply by um, arguing in, in very bizarre ways. And we have to expect that. We have to be patient. Human beings are not rational. Um, we are not rational. Um, they are not rational. And finally, of course, not only are there the negative aspects of technology, but there are genuine risks. That, as I say, I, I doubt there is anybody here who would disagree. Um, that there are genuine risks, but when arguing with somebody who seems to see only the threats, it's sometimes tempting to forget there are, are risks, and we need to keep that in mind. Um, so you may be wondering, um, having worked in environmental policy for 16 years, and um, being able to empathize as much as I do with people who tend to be opposed to technology, um, why am I even in favor of technology? Um, well, part of the answer to that question is simply that it's very exciting. Um, but there's a more serious reason to that. And that is that, um, put very simply, without technology, um, we are lost. And by technology, um, I mean soft technology. Not all technology has to be um, employ the, the, the latest with science. 
um, but also the really radical technologies such as nanotechnology. Um, whether you want to live forever, ever, whether you want to be resurrected via cryostasis, um, whether you want to um, live multiple lives and, and direct many entities um, with a single consciousness, uh, whatever new technologies mean to you, or whether you simply want to protect um, the planet that we um, inherited from, um, from nature, um, we need technology. We cannot do it without technology. Technology for me is nothing more and nothing less um, than the product of human endeavor and human ingenuity. So, again, coming back to the idea that concern for the environment must respect human aspirations, it must therefore respect the idea that ultimately technology has to be the answer. So, in summary, um, I believe that uh, nanotechnology and other emerging technologies um, can be an ally to environmental concern. Um, but in order to ensure that that happens, um, we need um, to understand and to some extent empathize with the genuine concerns that environmentalists and others have, um, while of course um, emphasizing the need to respect human aspirations and the need to look to technology as the answer. So that is my presentation. Um, I thank you all for your attention and I'll be very happy, as I say, to answer questions and uh, engage with you during the uh, formal and in informal interactions. Thank you. Anyone has questions for Peter, please limit them to the text chat box on the lower left side of your screen. Well, I'll, I'll reply to uh, um, Eskatoon Magic, who I know as uh, Julio in, in real life. Um, uh, Julio says that I, I know what my comments uh, would be, but um, Julie, I, I, I'm, I'm very eager to hear them uh, none, nonetheless and uh, debate with you here on Second Life, as we've been doing, uh, uh, especially at IET. So I'm, um, I'm going to um, read out uh, um, a comment from uh, Mihai Kujet. Apologies if I haven't uh, um, pronounced your name correctly. Um, you say we need to respect life uh, and that taking nukes into space and gas mining, I've lost the comment now, but I, I, I think I understand that comment uh, to mean that um, uh, technology it's also the responsibility of those who support technology um, to show that um, uh, it is actually something that is good for the planet and good for humanity. And, and that is, of course, a, a point very well taken. Somebody has asked me if I don't like uh, Homo erectus. Uh, well, yes, I, I would like to see some Homo erectus around. If we can uh, manage to resurrect some, then uh, why not? Uh, Natasha Cordo says, uh, don't you mean uh, nanomedicine? 
Um, perhaps you could maybe um, clarify that question. Um, then there's a comment from a question from Fortino. Should we call fear of change leg legitimate? Um, I believe it is not always legitimate. Um, I'd like to respond to that. I, it's an excellent question. It, of course, it depends very much on what you mean by legitimate. Um, um, okay, Natasha, I see that wasn't directed at me. Um, Fortino, yes, I, I basically agree. Fear of change isn't always legitimate. It's certainly not always healthy. In fact, I think uh, a lot of people um, tend to be very paralyzed by fear and it can be very destructive and change is what we fear um, more than anything else. But I also think that um, we do actually need fear because fear is um, what makes us um, aware of risks. And uh, in order to deal with risks and to avoid them, you of course have to be um, aware of them. Um, and so I, I think this is something that we can actually welcome the fact that people find change weird, they find it unsettling, um, this can be healthy. I, so for me, it's not so much a question of, of whether we welcome fear of change or, or, or wish um, it wasn't there. It's more a question of what people do with it. Are they focusing on real risks um, or imaginary ones? Um, Mohian um, asks whether I said something about nanotech and um, technological unemployment. Um, the short answer is no, I, I, I didn't, primarily because um, it's not um, what we would traditionally think of as a, a, um, an environmental issue per se. Um, uh, and it's not something that environmentalists tend to focus on a lot. Um, it is, of course, um, a very serious issue. Um, I did mention that technology can be very disruptive. There are always uh, winners and, and losers. Um, but it's not something that the environmental movement tends to focus on specifically. In fact, in a, in a way, it would be better if they did, because at least they would be um, focusing on um, real risks. Peter, to access a previously asked question, just scroll up within your chat box. Okay, sure. Um, have I missed some, Laurie? One from Natasha. It starts with, sorry, that comment was not for the speaker. Okay, sorry. I, yes, okay. Um, thanks, Laurie. Um, so the question is, what methods do you suggest we enable to verify the personal position of the ethicists who are determining rules and policies for nanotechnology and ensure that they don't use their political and or religious view to determine objective principles, this is of great concern. Um, that is, um, for me, a fascinating question. It's something that I've um, been starting to grapple with as I've um, increasingly looked at the ethics of emerging technologies um, over the last year or so. Um, I think, um, from my perspective, I mean, just, just to reveal my cards here, um, I have a, I had a Christian upbringing, but I don't consider myself to be religious. Um, and my view on ethics is essentially utilitarian. Um, but I'm also very much of the opinion um, that um, ethics and morality is not something that can ever be entirely objective. It is not something that you um, can derive from science. It is something that inevitably um, involves an element of choice. Um, and this is something that um, one needs to recognize. Um, I think we need to have the de debate with people of all um, shapes and sizes, um, political, religious, or other. Um, I think what we need to do essentially is to try our best to smoke out um, any beliefs or attitudes which seem to be um, non-evidence-based 
um, or where people are um, using evidence as a kind of uh, proxy uh, for their own preferences. So, for example, when I say that I, my ethics is utilitarian, um, it's because that is the um, ethical uh, framework which I find most aesthetically pleasing. And I don't actually pretend that it's more than that. And I think the more that people recognize that, um, that their ethical frameworks are inherently subjective, I think the better we are going to be able to, um, uh, to come to a genuine consensus on, on these issues, which for me is the most important thing. Uh, Brian Viper says that the general public's ignorance of nanotechnology and emerging technologies is disgusting. Um, uh, I don't disagree um, whether one is disgusted or not um, is as much a question of temperament uh, as, um, as much as anything else. But the bottom line is whether we're disgusted or not, it exists. and. Um, I think part of that ignorance is is willful because basically if you're scared about something, then often you just prefer not to think about it. So again, empathizing with the fear of change that underpins so much of this reticence, um, which by the way, I think also underpins a lot of religious attitudes, um, is also a way um, to... Um, uh, to combat this ignorance. Um, um, <laughs> Eskatoon magic um, tells us to screw evidence. Well, that, that's a point of view. Um, but um, it, it, it's not, Julio, that everything has to be evidence-based. But what I would say is that it's not evidence-based then if it is a statement about objective reality, then it's probably going to be false. And if it's a statement about preferences, such as finding your doggy sweet, then use the language of preferences. Don't try to um, uh, claim that it is more objective than it is. I think that's what I really mean by saying that our beliefs should be evidence-based. It's not that everything is about evidence. But if it's not evidence, then it's that we're making some kind of aesthetic choice. Uh, Zobed Zuma says that um, you're not sure that it's reasonable to expect the public to be educated about a technology that is still mostly hypothetical. Um, well, actually, I mean, the public is educated in various ways, for example, via the movie industry. Um, maybe that's not always the best um, educator. But I think it is possible to be educated about the possibilities, even to the extent that they're still quite um, hypothetical and uh, speculative. Um, SSK Chapter asks, how do we overcome the challenge regarding the political powers that always strive to protect the status quo? Why can't they even seem to deploy basic things like solar energy? Um, I think uh, fear of change, um, vested interests, um, how do you overcome it? I think um, the more that we manage to close the gap between those of us who are pro-technology and those of us um, who uh, are fearful of technology, but um, because they care for the environment or or similar things, the more we will be able to combat the vested interests. So it's another reason to try to make our peace with environmentalists, um, even those who um, can be frustratingly opposed to or simply ignorant of the uh, possibilities that technology has to offer. Um, Extropia says nanotechnology is not a technology, but an entire field of technological capabilities. Think of how many inventions fall under senti technology. Um, quite so. I mean, it, it's, um, that's absolutely right. Um, but what I think we can do with um, people who basically, for whom it's, it's nothing more than a word and a rather scary word at, at that, 
is to just give some examples of the kind of things that um, these different nanotechnologies have to offer. But of course, you're right, it's a vast area. Um, Julio uh, says everything is an aesthetic choice. Um, I disagree. I, I, I think um, I, I can't turn the sky purple by wanting it to be purple. I, I think some things really are about evidence, um, but much, much is aesthetic. Um, I, I, I think we can agree on that. Um, um, Natasha um, asks, if it is advised that all participants in the discussion debate are forthcoming about their moral religious political views, a more viable outcome is possible. I, I absolutely agree with that. I, I think um, uh, the more transparency, the, the better. Um, my only comment would be that it may be better to try to coax them to be more transparent um, rather than to um, insist that they are. But I mean, that, that's uh, a reaction. I, I, I would, I, I'm not particularly certain about that. Mihai says epigenetics and nanotechnological enhanced and sustained consciousness coupled with quantum computers that do not need cooling will bring us the deeper understanding of the dynamics of life and especially the dynamics of evolution. Yes, but what an environmentalist will say is um, it will also um, lead us to some kind of Promethean uh, Faustian pact with the devil um, and we will simply destroy what nature has bequeathed us. And again, we, we just need to understand that those perceptions exist um, and they're not entirely without a foundation because I think there are a lot of futures in which that does happen. Um, and we need to make sure that um, we actually use this knowledge, the understanding of the dynamics of life and the dynamic of evolution um, to actually realize our aspirations and not create some horrible dystopia, which of course is also possible. Um, Natasha asks, how do you suggest we might develop or build a team to establish the logic or rationale of supporting nanotechnology? Um, how might we become um, involved? Um, and Natasha, I'm, I'm not sure who exactly you mean by we, whether you mean TerraSem, whether you mean people at this conference, whether you mean uh, techno-progressives generally. I, I think, uh, I mean, there are so many ways um, uh, to become involved. I, I think one of my favorite philosophies of life is that you should work out what you do best uh, in life and what you love the most and, um, and focus on that. Um, so that, that, that's maybe a rather genetic, generic answer to your question, but I think um, everybody, to, uh, everybody needs to basically uh, focus on what they're best at. Um, okay, I'm just scrolling down. Mokian says, in the US there are several educators such as Mikio Kaku, uh, Degrasse Titan, who, in your opinion, could be a European communicator? That is an excellent question. Um, I don't have an immediate answer. I think there are a lot of um, questions. What I would say is maybe we shouldn't focus only on um, single well-known personalities. Um, let's try to crowdsource this one. Let's try to use the social media. Um, and, and let's let, let's be viral about it. Let's really just um, each of us um, work on the people we're closest to. And I, I mean, I'm I very much see this event as, as a networking opportunity. I, I, I would like to make uh, a lot of new friends here. And and let's just work together to um, educate people and educate ourselves um, about. Um, uh, the possibilities that the future uh, holds. Um, Brian Viper um, asks, uh, what age do you think it's important to learn about the concepts of nanotechnology? Um, I'm going to answer that by saying um, in the primary school, um, but 
after they first learned uh, mindfulness uh, technologies. The, the closest thing I have to a, a religion is uh, mindfulness. I, I'm a, a big fan. I mean mindfulness um, in the sense of Western psychology rather than Buddhism per se. But um, I, I think if we want to steer ourselves towards the best possible futures, um, we need to learn how to master our own thoughts, our own emotions, um, our own uh, urges, and um, that probably needs to come first. But I would suggest that um, learning about nanotech, it should start at a very early age. Um, uh, Maybach uh, Q suggests um, uh, that we learn to program. Um, yes, I do have a mathematics uh, background, but it's a long time ago. Um, but I, I know a lot of people say that programming is, um, is the, the, the skill of the future. Um, so um, good luck to you. Um, uh, okay, Mal Burns um, says the biggest fear is less the progress of technology in our lives, but the technologies that might enhance or coexist with our human selves. Do you think such changes are inevitable? If so, well, we suffer from a, a more major resistance than we, we have seen so far. I don't like to say that anything is inevitable. Um, I prefer to see everything as a matter of choice. That, to some extent, maybe goes to um, Julio's point that everything is aesthetic. Um, uh, I think such technology will be very difficult to stop. Um, Personally, I don't want it to stop, um, but I think um, what puts um, a lot of people off about new technology is the sheer weirdness. Um, when you really start to understand what possibilities technology has to offer, um, you realize just how weird the future is going to be. And I think there is something to be said um, for uh, keeping the technological pace of progress at least to manageable levels, if we can. Extropia says the changes are inevitable if humans are to survive indefinitely. Um, at some time in the future, the solar systems and, and later still the universe will not support humans in their current form. Um, I sort of agree with that. As I say, I, I dislike the idea that anything is inevitable, but um, basically I, I agree with you and, and it's basically underpinned that the last point I, I made in my presentation, technology has to be the answer. Um, um, because as, as you say, the solar system, you know, will the earth will fall into the sun or the sun will ex explode or, 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 or climate change will make the earth inhabitable um, or whatever. You, we need to have pretty radical technology to get, to get through this. Uh, Duan Buck asks whether I agree that the speed of all this evolving is getting faster and faster, if not exponential. I think it's more than exponential. Um, and yes, I'm sure that it's getting faster and faster. Um, and that's very exciting, but it's also partly what creates the risk because um, the question is, um, will we have the wisdom to um, deal with that technology in an appropriate way? And this is why I think that mindfulness um, skills is um, uh, are so um, important. Uh, Philippe Golding says that from a real politic point of view, how much clout do environmentalists really have to actually stop or slow down um, major developments? Um, I think to stop or slow it down, probably very little, um, but to be quite um, disruptive or to be an ally in helping us to address the risks and actually to, um, to, to make sure that we actually have a natural environment that many of us want, um, I think um, they can be a very powerful ally. So we should not overestimate them, but we shouldn't underestimate them um, either. Um, Maybach asks me if I'm aware of Ray Kurt's file. Um, in fact, it was looking at the singularity is near. Uh, I, I just came across it in my local bookstore and that's what um, got me into um, this whole transhumanism, techno-progressivism 
um, thing um, as recently as five years ago. So it's um, it's quite a, a, a new thing for me. I was an environmentalist um, before I was a techno progressive. Um, SSK Traptor says, uh, I understand that average IQs are rising over the last two decades. Other polls state that our current generations are less prone to care about uh, the environment uh, um, or synergy. Seems like a paradox. Um, th this is something um, that I'm also very much into minds about because sometimes I hear that um, uh, the younger generations are more environmentally conscious. Sometimes I hear um, uh, that they're not. I don't have kids myself. I'm, I'm 45 years old. So um, bottom line is I don't really know. Um, but um, yeah, it's... Um, I, I, I think social networking can be very important. Um, there was an article on IET that went up a day or two ago about slacktivism, which is basically people sort of clicking or liking a page and, and thinking that they've done something um, and questioning whether that really um, reflects a genuine commitment. So I, I guess the truth is the, the jury is out. I, I, I don't know, but it's... It's an important question anyway. Philippe Golding asks whether I personally aspire to an indefinitely extended health span. Um, yes, I do. Um, I Actually, I sometimes find it quite difficult to understand uh, um, people who don't. I think they're um, making a virtue out of necessity. Um, I don't have cryogenic insurance. That's one thing that I haven't um, yet got into. Um, but if you ask me, would I um, prefer to live a thousand years, one hundred years, ten thousand years, or a million years, then I'll go for the highest figure you can give me. Uh, Philippe uh, also asks me whether I self-identify as a transhumanist uh, publicly too. Um, I, the, the answer to the first question is, it, is yes. Um, it's something that um, still feels a bit weird to me, to be honest, because as I say, it's, it's recent. I was an environmentalist, uh, scientist, um, uh, well before, um, and, you know, more or less liberal or social democrat, well before I'd even heard of transhumanist, but it, it is something that it makes sense to me. Um, and well, I mean, I, I, I blog and, and, and comment quite publicly, um, but um, it's something that um, I'm, I'm quite coy about in my immediate social environment because a lot of people find it very uh, disturbing. Um, so probably not as publicly as, as I perhaps uh, could be. Um, Mihai comments that more than cleverness, we need humanity, we are not machines. Um, yeah, humanity... Um, yeah, I mean, humans can be really horrible as well, as well as being really great. So for me, it's not so much humanity as, as wisdom and empathy um, that I, I think we need. Um, Extropia expects lifespans to be dramatically extended, but wonders whether we should really say our goal is immortality. Um, uh, I think it's very much a, a personal choice, whether you want to be more um, ambitious or, or, or whether you just want to say radical life extension. Um, my, um, my preference is to say immortality, why not? Um, but I'm also aware that I might get run over by a bus tomorrow. So um, one has also to enjoy the present and not only um, care about the far future. Um, Maybach uh, points out that nanotech has been used to construct 3D printers for in vitro uh, uh, meat and combined with quantum mechanics can bring up virtual reality tanks or helmets that connect to our neurons. How exponential is the speed of nanotech to get us to 
these levels. Um, well, how quickly will we get there? Um, to be honest, I would say your guess is as good as mine. I know that a lot of transhumanists, a lot of futurologists, um, probably took ten, put 10 futurologists in a room and you'll get um, 11 different answers to that one. Um, uh, so, um, as I say, I would say your guess is as good as mine. Um, Philippe comments that death should remain an elective choice. I would modify um, that I would say that death should become an elective choice. I think at the moment it isn't in most cultures seen as an elective choice, and I think it needs to become an elective choice. That that, that would be my uh, opinion on that. Um, he asks, how should indefinite health span extension be democratized? Um, that's a very, very good question, and um, it comes back to um, the wisdom thing, it comes back to the morality thing, it comes back to the aesthetic thing and to choice. One difference between the US and Europe is that the US on the whole uh, tends to um, uh, emphasize more um, individual freedom um, and the ability to create wealth and to profit from the wealth one has created. Uh, Europe tends to be more socialist. It tends to be more um, about ensuring that everybody gets a fair share of the, the pie. Um, I think there are pros and cons. I personally think that what we need is a, is a balance. You need to have some pioneers and you need to have to tap into people's selfish motivation because otherwise um, they won't do anything. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you need to redistribute wealth and you need to ensure that technologies are um, uh, reasonably evenly dis um, um, distributed. Um, <laughs> Julio mentions that Europeans get wealth by other means, for example, corruption. Uh, that's uh, right. Uh, although, Julio, I don't think uh, we Europeans have a, a monopoly on corruption. I, I, I think that is uh, actually a global phenomenon, sadly. Uh, Mokian um, points out he sees the interaction between nanotech, biotech, 3D printing, and similar techniques as disruptive of the present uh, economy. What do you think will be the outcome of this paradigm shift? I actually think that's the wrong question to ask. I, I think the question we need to ask is what do we want the outcome of this um, paradigm shift to be? Because the, the answer to your question is it could be um, a lot of things. It's like the Hotel California. It could be heaven or it could be hell. Um, and um, it's up to us. What we need more than anything else to try to come to um, a consensus about what we want. Um, Extropia says that a world in which nobody is allowed to die is more dystopian than one in which nobody is exempt from dying. Um, Do we have time for one more question? Sure. Um, I'll, I, I have mixed views on that, actually, Extropia. I, I, I think we should be able to avoid both. Um, okay, I'm just scrolling down. Uh, I'm going to focus on Philippe's uh, question as the last one. He asks, what is my preferred prescription for managing, um, that is to say, minimizing downsides, maximizing benefits, the transition from a uh, pre to post nanobio info communication society. Um, um, in one word, I was no, in about three words, I will say um, mindfulness. Seriously, go on to Google and watch some mindfulness videos. I, I wholly recommend it. Um, utilitarian moral philosophy, it's my favorite. Um, and common sense. I think these are my three prescriptions to uh, manage the transition. So with that, um, uh, I think I'm a bit over time. So uh, thanks for all. I found it a very, very stimulating debate and I'm really looking forward to uh, further interactions. Okay, and on to our next presenter. We have Dr. Alex Wisner-Gross, who is an award-winning physicist, inventor, and entrepreneur. 
He is serving as an Institute Fellow at the Harvard University Institute for Applied Computational Science and as a research affiliate for the MIT Media Laboratory. Alex's research has been featured in Business Week, Wired, USA Today, Scientific American, and the New York Times, and he's also the recipient of more than 80 national and international distinctions. Let's welcome Alex Wisner gross to the podium. Thank you, Lori. <clears throat> Very much so. Uh, I, I think my talk is going to be a little bit uh, more technical than uh, Peter's uh, very uh, insightful observations. Uh, and so what I'd like to talk about uh, with the, the limited time I have is uh, to just take a, a step back and think for a moment uh, about what the, the best way of, uh, of regulating and uh, as necessary uh, making nanotechnology uh, a controllable technological development. Uh, and what I mean by that is we, in, in everyday life, see so many different examples of limited, narrow nanotechnologies. And uh, I would say that the state of the, uh, the environment today is somewhat analogous to uh, asking the question of what's the best way uh, to establish uh, a trusted computational environment if you're uh, sitting in the 1950s uh, before the uh, the invention of the microprocessor. We have yet to develop a unified nanotechnological framework uh, against which we could uh, encode all sorts of best practices uh, and uh, move safety forward. So uh, I, I think it, it's important to, to nonetheless recognize that the progress of civilization uh, has largely been driven uh, by uh, increased control over material properties. And in particular, we uh, have gained over uh, the millennia the ability to finely tune and much more recently uh, programmably tune uh, the, the actual physical properties of uh, the world around us. Uh, and there's this, uh, there's been this, uh, I think, essential interplay between uh, new properties uh, of the physical world around us, new material properties, uh, as well as uh, new forms of programmability. Uh, and to, to just elaborate on that point, let's see, hope everyone can see this. Um, so this is uh, a history, uh, maybe a little bit contrived, but I try to capture here uh, the, the rough history uh, of programmability. So starting uh, with uh, the first three points uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see uh, natural examples of programmability, ribosomes, ribozymes, uh, polyketide synthases, and, and so on, uh, all the way up through uh, more recent examples, the development of movable type. And these are all examples of taking one physical signal, uh, whether it's uh, RNA in, in the case of uh, uh, naturally occurring uh, ribozymes and ribosomes uh, being converted into uh, uh, polypeptides, or whether it's, uh, for the example of the transistor, uh, voltages that are being programmably turned into currents. And in the lower right-hand corner here, I've, uh, I've put together a list of some of the, the more interesting recent uh, thoughts, and these are still, for the most part, theoretical, although there's been some intriguing progress uh, in these directions towards uh, what uh, the, the consensus, uh, in some cases, the consensus futurist wisdom has been regarding what the, the future of uh, being able to program our physical world has looked like. Uh, so we start uh, in 87 with uh, Eric Drexler's assembler vision, uh, which has uh, morphed, uh, which had morphed uh, as of 92 to this notion of, uh, of matter compilers. Uh, and then more recent visions um, of completely controlling uh, the physical manifestations of surfaces uh, using uh, this, this notion of uh, quantum programmable matter uh, and uh, a variety of other uh, concepts like digital fabricators. So in some sense, the notion of turning our environment uh, at a planetary scale, at, uh, at an everyday human scale, uh, into uh, a programmable substrate 
which I think is the, the long-term goal that nanotechnology has been chasing. Uh, it's, uh, it's still something of a moving target, but I, I'd like to think that uh, we're converging uh, on uh, a series uh, of uh, specific technological developments that will create this. And uh, in particular, I think it's possible um, to, uh, to fit all of these developments uh, very naturally uh, into this sort of framework. Let's see if I can get this up on both. Yes, perfect. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's possible to uh, to fit all of these developments into a, a very nice natural framework. So for those of you who are able to, to see this, uh, I've taken uh, many of these developments as well as many more uh, and fit them into uh, uh, into this nice matrix where we're uh, basically sorting them by the nature of the physical input signal uh, and the nature of the physical output signal. So you can fit everything from transistors to microfluidic logic to neuron chips within this very natural framework. Almost every interesting development uh, over the past 20 years in nanotechnology fits very naturally into this framework where you consider some form of input signal, whether it's a mechanical input signal. Uh, yes, by the way, feel free to, to step up closer. We're, I think, size limited, but if anyone wants to get a closer view, um, by all means, take a step up. So the, the notion here is uh, you have a variety of input signals, mechanical input signals, thermal input signals, uh, ranging from magnetic, chemical, uh, and ionic polymeric signals. Oh, good. Thank you, Mel, for pointing that out. People can zoom also. Uh, and if you want the, the detailed file, by all means, just uh, just contact me. I have a variety of different contact points at the bottom of each slide. So I just wanted to show that as a bit of a teaser for where I think uh, nanotech overall uh, might end up uh, in, uh, in the sense that all of these, uh, what might be perceived as sparse developments are in fact uh, quite naturally uh, fittable into a, a very elegant framework. And so keeping this in mind that maybe all of these nanotechnological developments as well as a number of other developments in uh, neurotechnology uh, that, uh, uh, that might not uh, perhaps seem to be uh, as tightly related in fact fit into this cute framework. And so one can then ask, okay, if you have this framework, what does that say about where the future of nanotech is going? And what does that say also about the best ways to make sure that, uh, to, to borrow notions from, uh, from the AI side, that uh, as nanotech develops, that we develop friendly nanotech. So we come to this notion that, uh, again, if we were asking the question in the 1940s or the 1950s, what's the best way to ensure uh, safe, secure computation, the answer would have to be that you're asking the question too early because you don't have a unified substrate for, for computing. Uh, I'm often, uh, uh, again, from an economics point of view, uh, fond of, of also making the, uh, the analogy that uh, sometimes uh, asking uh, these technological questions uh, can become quite expensive by asking the questions out of order, that asking the, the question in the absence uh, of uh, uh, a unified programmable nanotechnological substrate uh, might even be uh, as difficult uh, to, to go ahead and, and uh, implement as, say, trying to build a supercomputer during the American Civil War. The order of technological developments matters enormously. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I think in order to, uh, to more sensibly ask what is the best way to ensure ethical nanotechnology uh, and secure nanotechnology and friendly nanotechnology, what we really need first uh, as a, uh, uh, a necessary uh, precondition for that is to have a sufficiently unified platform, platform. such that we're not such forced. We're not forced. To... I'm hearing an echo I'm on, hearing someone an echo on someone else's side. Someone has their speaker turned on. Turn on. I'll just continue. I'll just continue. Um, um, so the the idea is that uh, 
rather than being forced to address a fragmented market where you see lots of individual nanotechnological developments. And, and by nanotech, I'm referring uh, not to the more banal definition, uh, such as uh, nanoscale features on microprocessors, but a uh, much more general sense of nanotechnology, uh, namely uh, robots or, or other uh, physical world devices that are free-floating, not confined, uh, not prepackaged uh, in ways that they can't interact with the rest of the environment. It's, uh, I think it's going to be a necessary precondition to have uh, a unified substrate so that uh, ensuring friendliness and security and ethics is not fragmented uh, across a thousand different niche applications. And so one can ask, well, what does this look like? I think the answer will turn out to be something on the order of a universal programming surface, programmable surface. Uh, the, the surface in particular, I think, uh, will turn out uh, to be absolutely essential because surfaces are, are the, the main opportunity for, uh, for any object to interact with the outside universe. So uh, you can sort of debate the fine points of, do we want a universal programmable uh, nanorobot? Do we want a surface? Do we want some sort of bulk solution? Um, this is a finer point. You could argue that uh, many of the visions that have been had for swarms of, of nanorobot uh, style implementations are in fact just very high surface area to volume ratio uh, surfaces. So uh, zooming in a bit on this concept uh, of, uh, of having a universal programmable surface as a precondition to being able to, uh, to regulate and to ensure the ethics of environmentally deployed nanotechnologies, you're going to want all of these different functionalities, which right now uh, are basically decoupled, uh, to be built into the surface. Uh, so think, for example, of the convergence that we've seen over the past few years in the smartphone market, uh, and think about the implications of having a variety of different functionalities unified on a single software, hardware, uh, and service architecture uh, versus trying to regulate privacy and security and a bunch of other things when all of those functionalities are fragmented into a thousand independent devices and you sort of get a sense of uh, where I'm going with this notion. So uh, with my remaining time, I'm just going to walk through uh, some examples along uh, each of these uh, six different classes of functionality. Uh, I've selected representative examples from my own research but it's quite easy to find examples uh, from, uh, from other research programs uh, as well. So let's take a look first. Mechanical programmability. So this is uh, perhaps one of the, the most obvious opportunities. Uh, the general concept here is uh, to take the physical world and uh, make it mechanically accessible. So one could uh, imagine in the very near-term future uh, having a, a mechanically programmable surface uh, that is able to, uh, to dynamically and programmatically move objects around. Uh, and I, I won't go too deeply into the details on any of these, maybe in the, the Q&A right after the talk, since uh, I'm running up against a time limit. We can, uh, we can discuss in greater detail how one goes about uh, implementing any of these forms of programmability, but the essence for mechanical programmability uh, is a surface that uh, has uh, enormous dexterity and is able to, to move around physical objects in a completely programmatic way. Uh, and I'll note, uh, since we're, we're still on the first uh, dimension of functionality, that the overall intention here is to unify all of these different classes uh, of functionality into a single surface. Point to uh, a second example, chemical functionality. This is some work that I did a few years back um, regarding uh, creating surfaces uh, that uh, are able to selectively tune for, uh, for specific classes of molecules using their structure. Um, and in general, you want surfaces that are able to bind selectively to very targeted molecules, uh, in some cases even uh, able to uh, to form bonds or electrical connections to uh, a variety of classes of molecules. And again, if anyone would like to discuss 
the, the technical details here. I'm happy to, to do so in the Q&A or offline. Um, contact info, again, is at the bottom. Moving on to, uh, to the third class. Uh, so we have uh, magnetic programmability, uh, and uh, I, I think this is perhaps one of the, the more interesting uh, theoretical justifications for, uh, for building uh, this sort of rich environment uh, where we have a variety of self-assembling behaviors and uh, in the world of physics, um, local magnetic interactions are uh, one of the most attractive ways of modeling self-assembly swarm behavior, a number of other uh, tropes that you see pop up pretty frequently um, in, uh, in futurist studies of, of nanotechnology. So uh, this is a, a paper I wrote a few years ago showing that it's possible to achieve uh, rich self-assembly uh, using, uh, using agents, uh, which can be modeled in a number of ways, uh, that uh, have no preferred rules, in a sense, uh, showing that structure uh, of uh, a very precise sort can emerge spontaneously without actually requiring even any rules for local interaction, any preference for pools. And again, uh, this generalizes very well to surfaces that can control their own uh, magnetic properties uh, very, uh, very precisely and very richly using only the, the coarsest of means of control. Moving along, so we have uh, we have three forms of programmability left. Um, so uh, we have hydrodynamic programmability, electrical programmability, and thermal programmability. So some of these uh, may start to become more recognizable and a bit less abstract. So let's start with uh, hydrodynamic programmability. Many of you may have heard of uh, recent advances in what are called labs on chips or laboratories on chips. Um, uh, as well as microfluidics. So uh, this is a paper um, uh, I wrote a few years ago that uh, that is, I, I think, uh, spells out a, a very uh, definitive vision as to what these uh, programmable microfluidic and nanofluidic labs on chips could look like. Um, and again, I would not be surprised if we start to fill our environment with many systems based on similar principles. So this is a paper where I show that um, a variety of uh, silicon-based nanostructures, many of you have probably heard of carbon nanotubes, uh, this paper shows uh, the creation of what are called silicon nanotubes, uh, which are less well known, uh, and how they can be used uh, for uh, a variety of different uh, structural purposes, uh, for branched uh, fluidic devices, for pumping fluids um, and uh, a variety of applications like that, as well as being able to be simultaneously used as transistors. So uh, in the not too distant future, we may be sequencing uh, single-stranded DNA using devices quite similar to these uh, where you can pump uh, fluids, uh, very small volumes of fluid through, uh, through these uh, uh, hollow nanostructures treating them as pipes uh, while simultaneously treating them as uh, switchable and gateable electrical components. Next example, uh, electrical programmability. So um, fun example here, when Google you know, famously uh, has a, a blade server fail, it's quite common to just leave the blade server uh, in, uh, uh, in its chassis uh, in a failed state and use software to route around it. Right now, uh, in terms of uh, environmentally deployed nanotechnologies, we don't have the same ability for uh, desktop computation. So imagine a, a not too distant future where uh, if an electrical component breaks in, uh, in one of your computational devices, your hardware has the ability to pull new devices uh, out of uh, a colloid, perhaps resembling um, something like printer toner, and uh, the hardware is able to, uh, to autonomously connect up to the devices and rewire itself dynamically. Uh, so this is a, a paper from a few years ago where I demonstrated that it's possible to build self-reconfiguring nanoelectronic systems that do just that, that pull uh, semiconductor nanostructures uh, out, of, uh, uh, out of a liquid that they're floating in, out of a colloid, 
uh, and to uh, using a physical effect called dielectrophoresis actually uh, uh, wire up uh, electrical contact to them. Uh, and then even uh, if you look in the lower left-hand corner of this slide, uh, switch them, uh, switch these components uh, uh, reversibly and reconfigurably uh, between uh, sets of, of contacts. Uh, and then if you look in the lower right-hand corner, this can be done with four electrodes as well. And then at the very lower right, when you're done with these components, when they are no longer useful or when they themselves break, um, it's possible to, uh, to detonate them using a high current pulse uh, and thereby repeat this process over and over again. So I think uh, this is sort of a preview of what we might see in the future, where it's possible to, to take entire, say, cores of microprocessors, uh, pull them without any manual intervention uh, into slots, uh, immediately uh, uh, make electrical contact to them, and then remove them as necessary. And this is the sort of electrical, mechanical programmability and reconfigurability that, uh, you know, quite frankly, from a, a sci-fi point of view, uh, would have uh, been seen in the context of Star Trek's Borg or, or some other sort of fantastical uh, uh, set of technologies, but in fact, this is quite real. And finally, I'll, I'll talk briefly about uh, thermal programmability. So uh, on the thermal side, there are some interesting uh, and immediate biomedical applications of uh, having control in particular uh, over the thermodynamics uh, of, uh, of water-based systems, uh, in large part because so much biology is, di is dictated by hydrogen bond networks. So if you can control uh, the behavior of hydrogen bonding uh, at room temperature, you can do some really interesting uh, things uh, in the medical space. Um, in particular here, uh, the generic idea is to use uh, uh, finely structured diamond surfaces to control hydrogen bond networks in their vicinity, uh, and more specifically, to, uh, to be able to raise, and I'll just skip on to the next slide here, to raise uh, the effective uh, melting temperature of uh, aqueous water in the vicinity of a nanostructured diamond surface uh, up to human body temperature. And in some sense, this is a holy grail of controlling uh, nanoscale hydrogen bond networks, because if you can do that, you can effectively treat uh, water as if it were ice, even though it might be at room or even uh, human body temperature. Uh, and as a result, you can then uh, selectively control which bonds form, uh, and this enables a, a whole host of, of interesting uh, nanotech implications for environmental conditions. Uh, one obvious one is uh, building out a novel set of coatings for implants and other devices that uh, enable the devices to uh, reduce uh, shear uh, as well as uh, corrosion. So there is this interesting uh, set of developments uh, in, uh, I would say, in the implant space overall right now concerning uh, titanium uh, joint implants versus other materials uh, and uh, a solution uh, somewhat like this one, where uh, implant surfaces are coated with, uh, with a, a nanostructured uh, set of atoms that alter the, the local properties uh, of surrounding uh, fluid uh, in the human body, uh, has the potential to, uh, to reduce corrosion uh, and to, uh, to perhaps create a, a softer, a softer um, boundary layer that uh, that reduces abrasion on surrounding tissue, and so um, again, not not to get uh, too deep in the technical details, uh, this is just a chart showing that uh, that using uh, the sort of chemical modification of a, a surface, it's possible to dramatically raise the melting temperature of water in its vicinity, thus having the the net effect of basically creating ice uh, at human body temperature at 310 Kelvin. Uh, that's thick enough to be uh, of utility in reducing abrasion. So you can think of this as uh, a sort of warm ice. We want a detailed visualization uh, of what this looks like. 
uh, this gives you a rough sense, so you can see the impact uh, of the special coding in, in terms of a, a time-averaged uh, molecular dynamics simulation. Uh, and you can see that, uh, in fact, uh, many layers, many bilayers of ice uh, are stabilized by this effect. So I think uh, just, I think just uh, uh, backing up back and, uh, and thinking along these lines, um, it's interesting to, to think, and, and I'm happy to open this up to Q&A, uh, about uh, various opportunities for unifying all these forms of nanotechnology that we have uh, with the ultimate goal of, uh, of creating a unified platform that would then enable secure and ethical uh, and uh, more generally safer nanotechnologies. I think we're not quite there yet, but I think, uh, and, and my assessment of the field, uh, having uh, uh, done work in it for a number of years now, is that once uh, we have this unified uh, hardware substrate, or even the, the first example of a unified hardware substrate, uh, then all of this uh, all of this thinking that's uh, perhaps been a bit pent up over the years, waiting for, uh, for uh, these sorts of capabilities will finally start to make a great deal of sense, and we can finally start to apply all of these uh, principles of, uh, of safe and ethical nanotechnology to a single unified system. Uh, such that we don't have to deal with the, the fragmented set of technologies that we have today. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll take questions. And again, uh, if anyone wants to talk to me offline, uh, I've put all my contact information at the bottom of this slide. But thank you very much. I noticed uh, a number uh, of people asked me questions uh, during the talk. Um, if you could just resend your questions, um, I'll also look back through my history and see which ones I can find. Have you done some research on liquid crystals? Um, so, so the question is uh, liquid, liquid crystal uh, research. Uh, research. Uh, Liquid crystals uh, have not been a, a primary focus of mine. Uh, that said, uh, in the, the general area of, uh, of soft condensed matter, um, there are many, uh, I would say, many adjacent physical systems. And one could point uh, to, uh, to a number of examples, especially the, uh, the raised temperature ice uh, as, a, uh, as one example. That said, liquid crystals are a beautiful example uh, that I do have. Uh, in that matrix slide uh, that uh, speaks in general um, to turning local voltages uh, into, uh, into uh, uh, molecular alignments and ultimately using voltages to gate things like optics. Uh, question from Philippe Golding, what do I consider to be the most promising path to computationally optimized matter, uh, also called computronium? It's an interesting question. Um, it's, it's not entirely clear that uh, the question of computronium will actually make that much of a difference over the next 30 years. It's something that I've, I've thought about quite a bit, obviously. Um, I, I think that can be broken down into two separate questions. What is, uh, what is the shortest path to a sort of Drexlerian molecular nanotech type future? Uh, and what is the shortest path to dense computation? Um, uh, there's been a, a lot of interesting thinking uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, analyzing what an optimal computer given a certain set of physical resources would look like. Uh, and uh, it may very well end up being the case that there's no single global optimal solution, which has always been uh, the implicit assumption with computronium. Computronium assumes that there's going to be some presumably atom or, or some other sort of sa stable matter-based uh, optimal solution for computation when, in fact, uh, the, the little research that has been done in the area, for example, uh, Seth Lloyd's set of theory papers on uh, the ultimate limits of computation, suggests that there probably isn't a single um, optimal limit. Uh, in fact, uh, if anything, 
there might, uh, I think we, we will discover at the end that there's uh, uh, a single uh, tunable limit where you can tune between uh, optimal serial computing capability and optimal uh, parallel computing capability. Uh, and uh, certainly Seth's, look, Seth's work suggests that uh, the optimal serial computer is probably some form of black hole where uh, the input is shining perhaps via some sort of gamma ray laser input in and then quickly uh, reading out information via Hawking radiation. Um, and so if, if you buy the notion that a the ultimate serial computer is a black hole, uh, the ultimate parallel computer uh, Seth found would look something like a box of plasma, uh, uh, again, under certain assumptions. Neither of these uh, limits really looks anything like uh, the sort of diamondoid type computronium uh, that uh, many people have envisioned. So it's, I would say it's quite possible that uh, the, the closest thing that we will have to computronium might not even resemble uh, today's uh, today's microprocessor systems that are based largely on solid state systems. So the question is, what is the, uh, mm. what's the critical path to building out computronium? Uh, I would probably say it's, it's going to be some exotic pathway that doesn't focus at all on the material science and is probably focused on analyzing what the optimal theoretical limits are and then uh, appropriately nudging, uh, if anything, particle physics and plasma physics in the direction of uh, of building systems that can compute. Other questions? Lori, did you say there was a way to pull up the chat history? Yes, uh, you just go to the lower left box of your lower toolbar. It says chat. You click on that, and it should come up. Got it. All right, perfect. All right, I will go back and answer all these questions now. Um, let's do it in reverse order. Um, all right. Uh, so Fleddy asks, what is your general approach for making these nanobots? What kind of equipment is necessary? Um, uh, Fleddy, I would say uh, my answer to that question has changed uh, over the past 10 years or so. I would think, so we're in 2012. I think 2002, um, many people in the field felt that uh, the, the general substrate for making general purpose nanorobots uh, might look something uh, like free-floating adaptations of uh, existing semiconductor technologies, so semiconductor nanowires, uh, a variety of, um, of detached semiconductor nanostructures. Uh, asked that question today, I would say my view has radically changed uh, in the sense that uh, the most promising technologies I see that have the, the general uh, potential to, uh, to build in a number of these functionalities uh, are probably, uh, and somewhat ironically, uh, structural DNA-based techniques. Um, it's something that I, I never would have guessed uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but uh, structural DNA has made such remarkable progress. Uh, so these, these are uh, using uh, self-bonded DNA, uh, in some cases RNA, but mostly DNA, uh, to build out nanomachines, uh, to build uh, computational capabilities, walkers, robotic uh, capabilities. And so, for example, the Foresight Institute uh, has a couple of uh, what they call Feynman Grand Prizes for building out uh, a small manipulator arm and a, a small uh, logic-based half-adder circuit. Uh, and if I had to guess what uh, the, uh, the shortest path to that sort of functionality would be right now, um, my guess would now be something based on uh, uh, based on nucleotides. Structural DNA certainly looks right now like uh, the, the winning horse uh, in that substrate race. Of course, subject to, to change over time, but there have been so many surprises already, uh, one would think that we'd uh, start to, to be inching up to, uh, to an answer soon. Lars Steiner asks, is there any medical uh, area that's uh, underway with this technology? Um, I assume, uh, Lars, that, that you're referring uh, 
to uh, to uh, microfluidic technologies, um, although all of these are relevant to, to medical technology, and the answer is yes, absolutely. The the revolution in uh, in DNA sequencing is uh, is being driven uh, in large part by advances in uh, in microfluidics and uh, in control over small volumes of uh, of liquids on surfaces. So. Uh, while that isn't perhaps ubiquitous yet, uh, I expect it will be uh, quite ubiquitous uh, in the near-term future. Uh, let's see. Uh, question is uh, from Philippe. Uh, how would you go about programming von Neumann probes? It's an interesting question. Um, so you know, von Neumann probe, of course, is this famous model for self-replicating uh, space probe uh, as certainly one way to colonize and uh, explore the universe. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, by programming the probes, I assume, Philippe, uh, you're, you're asking uh, what's the best way to, to build one, um, leaving the actual intentionality of programming up to, to someone else. Uh, and uh, I, I would say the answer is probably the, the same set of technologies that will, uh, under our environmental conditions, produce uh, many of these uh, these sorts of futuristic uh, uh, self-replicating uh, uh, and uh, fully programmable uh, uh, technologies that many of them, uh, I suspect, with only minor tweaks would lend themselves naturally to space. And then you could ask the question of um, what sorts of uh, adaptations would be needed for, uh, for more extreme environments, for higher temperature environments, for example. Um, and that's, again, an interesting question. Uh, one can uh, say, for example, that DNA, given its uh, narrow, uh, narrow range uh, of, uh, uh, of non-melted temperatures, uh, that it's uniquely suited to sort of terrestrial environments, and that if you want uh, a probe that's going to have to do things like uh, melt planets and uh, re, uh, reappropriate uh, and recruit uh, extraterrestrial resources that you want uh, a substrate for the system that's going to be much more general in nature, uh, and so uh, again, it's a fun it's a fun discussion to have. Um, perhaps not uh, structural DNA based technologies for higher temperature applications, but uh, there are certainly many other contenders that would be uh, quite readily accessible for doing that. Uh, Mochian asks. Can graphene substitute all the present material used for electronics? Good question. The answer is not yet. Uh, graphene is an amazing conductor. Uh, it's a record-holding conductor uh, in certain senses. Um, thus far, graphene uh, has not proven to be as wonderful as a, a semiconductor. So many of the, the studies which you may see where graphene is, uh, is used for electronics, it, it's typically used uh, for example, in, in transistor studies, it's typically used as uh, a gating material uh, or contact material. So you're basically substituting graphene for metal contacts rather than for the semiconductor channel. That said, there has also been quite a bit, lot of interesting work in uh, structuring defects in graphene uh, in a number of interesting ways so that we can still recover um, uh, gain and, you know, the other critical uh, amplifying components uh, of semiconductor channels. We have time for one or two more questions. I'm just scrolling back through the list. Yes, you do. Great. Uh, let's see here. Uh, if anyone wants to ask any new questions, I think I've answered most of uh, most of the questions going back. Um, I'll, I'll just wait uh, a few seconds for someone else to ask. Uh, so Maybach asks, uh, through my history, what did I find most appealing? Um, I'll assume Maybach that, that you're asking about uh, which uh, which technologies uh, do I find most appealing? Um, and that's actually, right, good. Um, I think that's actually a really interesting question. Uh, my view has changed quite a bit on this. If, if you had asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have said absolutely nanotechnology is, uh, is the critical path to 
this concept of uh, technological singularity or some other, uh, say, uh, at the time, I think the the uh, the information superhighway uh, equivalent term was the next industrial revolution. Um, so it, it certainly seemed 10 years ago like nanotech was, and by nanotech, again, uh, I'm not referring to uh, to uh, evolutionary uh, developments in semiconductor technology, but say revolutionary, um, perhaps even free-floating environmental nanotech seemed like it was a critical path technology to the next industrial revolution. Uh, asked that question now, I'm no longer certain of that. Uh, and the reason is about 10 years ago or so, uh, we were still sort of shaking off uh, the last vestiges of what was called the AI winter, uh, which uh, many people feel began in the 1980s uh, with um, the disappointment surrounding the non-delivery by artificial intelligence researchers of many key technologies. Uh, and, you know, it's really, I would say, only been in the past 10 years or so that AI has finally uh, begun to to deliver on many long promised uh, technologies. Um, and I would say right now, we're in something of a nanotech winter that uh, in 2001, when the National Nanotechnology Initiative was funded with billions of dollars by the federal government, it seemed, uh, I would say, pretty uh, obvious and conventional wisdom that nanotech was going to be the next big thing and that this was the true critical path to uh, all of these life-changing technologies that we wanted. But, you know, it's a funny thing uh, relying on uh, on funding to, to sort of uh, tease out what the future looks like when uh, the funding was ultimately reduced and, and I would say largely bifurcated into funding for energy-oriented nanotech and funding for uh, medicine-oriented nanotech. Uh, and the funding for, for general nanotechnologies has been sharply reduced. I would say that uh, it's no longer obvious that uh, that general nanotech uh, is going to be the critical path to, uh, which isn't to say it won't be important, it's just that it won't be critical path to uh, to the next big revolution where you can call that the singularity, you can call it the next industrial revolution, call it whatever you want. Uh, and it's, I would say in 2012, it seems to me more that uh, developments in artificial intelligence uh, will have a, a cleaner line of sight to uh, to these sorts of changes. And uh, again, as I alluded uh, in uh, in the first part of my talk, order is everything. The the order of of uh, events in terms of which technologies uh, become mainstream first completely determines the outcome. So if we uh, if we uh, live in uh, again, I'll, I'll make some some fictional references. Uh, if nanotech comes before AI, then maybe we live in a Neil Stevenson Diamond Age universe. Uh, if uh, if high energy uh, sources uh, come before nanotech and come before AI, then we end up in a Star Trek style universe. If uh, AI comes before uh, high energy and strong nanotech, we end up in perhaps a Greg Egan style, or you, know, you can cite your favorite authors. But the order is everything. Uh, and again, it's not to say that all of these technologies aren't proceeding in parallel. It's just to say that when you're dealing with exponential technologies, several exponential technologies, not just one, several of them, even small differences in the characteristic exponent associated with each technology completely determine the outcome. Because if one technology is uh, running on an exponential growth pattern that's slightly faster than the others, then in a very short amount of time, any exponential technology can dominate all the other exponentially improving technologies. So, I mean, if, if you take away one message from this talk, I, I think that would be it, that it's so important to, to look at not just exponential technologies in general. Everyone knows that exponentially improving technologies will dominate non-exponential technologies, but even among exponential technologies, it's really important if, if you're being forced to bet scarce resources uh, on one or, or a few projects uh, or programs, uh, make sure that you're focusing your attention on uh, the one or two exponential technologies that have a faster exponent than all of the other ones, because in the end, it's not just enough to focus on exponentially improving technologies overall.
I think that that about wraps it up, <clears throat> Alex. And that was a most stimulating presentation and Q and A. Great, thank you. Okay, our next speaker and last speaker is the president and co-founder of Terrace Movement Inc. and the host of our workshop today. Please welcome Vitalogy Destiny, aka Dr. Martine Rothblatt, to the podium. Thanks, Lori, um, and thank all of you for attending this eighth uh, workshop on geoethical nanotechnology. I'll ask um, Lori to stand by and move forward the slides as uh, need be. Um, my title slide is Geoethical Rules for Nanotechnology Advances. The uh, next slide summarizes um, types of technology which I would group under nanotechnological advances. Um, almost by definition, manufacturing at submicron sizes, um, also self-replicating submicron machines, which um, could be a subset of manufacturing, also biotechnological machines as most of these operate at submicron sizes. Synthetic uh, genomics and biotechnological uh, medicines and uh, molecular computing. So a fairly wide range of activity. Uh, what's common to almost all of these is that the technology that is um, implemented in one place has a very high likelihood of having dispersive effects over a wide geographic area. Um, my next slide um, defines what I mean in the title slide by geoethical rules. I believe there are two basic uh, principles of geoethics. The principle of consent and the principle of compliance. The principle of consent is to obtain prior terms of consent from such others or their representatives who may foreseeably be materially and adversely affected by one's life science actions. The principle of compliance is to act pursuant to the principle of consent strictly in accordance with independent assurance of one's compliance. So, in other words, the principle of consent in plain language is not to affect somebody else in an adverse way without their permission. And the principle of compliance is to have an independent third party um, decide whether or not um, you're complying with um, their consent. Um, my next slide aims to make point that geoethics is a cultural universal among humans. Um, I think there are kind of four separate arguments for this. One is that geoethics comes down to what's called uh, fundamental fairness or equal protection. It's the uh, notion in every society that um, similar things should be treated similarly. Um, what happens in human societies is that they very quickly uh, find even slight differences in similar things and decides, decide that um, use those slight differences as justification for differential treatment. Sometimes that could be wise, sometimes it could be horrible. 
Uh, a second reason that geoethics is a cultural universal is that there seems to be an evolutionary tendency toward categorization. Um, people and animals that tended to react to similar things similarly had a higher likelihood of passing on their genes than those that didn't. If, um, if something that looked like a threat was reacted to before it pounced on us, um, we tended to pass on our genes. And so this um, concept of treating similar things similarly um, is not just a um, intellectual idea in every culture, probably has an evolutionary uh, backdrop. A third argument for the cultural universality of geoethics lies in the nature of consciousness. There is um, a great deal of confusing and perhaps not so confusing literature written on consciousness. But um, one thing which is um, consistent across all, all writers is that it involves um, placing oneself um, somewhat outside themselves and seeing yourself how others would see you. Um, even um, primates other than humans have this ability to um, guess what another member of the tribe is likely to be doing and react accordingly. So this idea of treating others as one would like to have oneself treated also has a um, grounding in consciousness. And then finally, a fourth argument for the cultural universality of geoethics is um, Darwinian group selection. Uh, this is kind of summarized in Sir Francis Bacon's quote, if we do not maintain justice, then justice will not maintain us. In other words, societies that are just uh, tend to last longer and self-perpetuate themselves, and societies that are not tend to uh, end up in some form or another of self-immolation. So these are, are four different arguments for the cultural universality of geoethics. But whether it's a universal or not, I do think it's a, it's a useful um, tool for managing uh, dispersive nanotechnology. The uh, next slide sort of begins to differentiate geoethics from bioethics. Uh, bioethics is, um, is based on the concepts of autonomy, beneficence, non-malfeasance, and justice. But bioethics does not seem to be uh, enough when we come to geographically dispersive technology, such as self-replicating nanotechnology. Because with regard to autonomy, um, if we're treating just an individual patient, we can ask them if they want to be treated. But if we are causing an effect on populations um, far removed from the center of our technological activity, who would we ask? And um, it's because bioethics is so limited to an individual patient or a small group of research subjects that I think um, we're driven beyond the borders of bioethics when we start talking about dispersive nanotechnology. The next slide talks about the practicality of geoethics. Um, we'll first start with consent and, and then we'll go into compliance. So um, some of the components of the principle of consent are, are that consent is needed only if somebody will be materially and adversely affected. So who is going to decide whether or not somebody is materially and adversely affected, and specifically foreseeably materially and adversely affected? I think the best we can do is to endeavor to have a scientific determination of who may be materially and adversely affected. It um, may not always be uh, accurate. Um, sometimes it may be catastrophically wrong, but I think it's, it's better than um, the nanotechnology actor deciding for themselves. 
who will be uh, foreseeably materially and adversely affected. And I think based on uh, detailed proposals, it would be possible to make a, um, a good scientific determination of who would be foreseeably materially and adversely affected uh, most of the time, if not almost all of the time. Second component of the principle of consent is determining um, who it is that's able to give consent. Um, individuals um, cannot always be uh, trusted to give consent on their own behalf because they may lack capacity. They may lack mental capacity. They may lack uh, medical capacity if they're seriously um, infirm. Uh, they may be um, under oppression. Um, they may be imprisoned. We talk in the principle of consent about individuals or their representatives. Um, it's not always clear that people who claim to be representatives for others actually are representatives. You can have totalitarian uh, situations. You could have manipulated populations. So I think in addition to having a scientific determination of who is foreseeably materially and adversely affected, you also have to have a legal determination of um, whether or not um, adequate consent can be obtained and has been obtained for those cases where there are populations being materially and adversely affected. So in summary, I think the principle of consent is very proactionary without at the same time forsaking precaution. The next slide talks about the practicality of the compliance principle, the other half of geoethics. Uh, the compliance principle requires uh, independent assurance with the terms of any consent that has been obtained. I think here um, we need to have a legal determination of whether or not assurance is in fact independent. Um, it's important for um, legal personnel to determine uh, transparency, lack of conflicts, demonstrated expertise uh, with regard to whichever party is being set up to ensure compliance with any terms of consent. So you could have a different body uh, being responsible for compliance with many different nanotechnologies, a different body for, for each project or some bodies for multiple projects. Uh, many hospitals have a single institutional review board ensuring compliance with the terms of consent of uh, patients undergoing medical procedures or experiments. Uh, but the, the key point here is that um, lawyers will not give us absolute assurance that the independent assurance is in fact independent. Uh, lawyers can make mistakes. Uh, lawyers' um, assessments can be undermined. But it's better than the nanotechnology actor themselves um, providing their own assurance. In other words, having a, a fox guard the, the chickens. So by requiring there be legal determination, there's a bona fide effort here um, to ensure that the independence really is independent. And that is the, the training of lawyers um, especially specialists in this area, to ensure that through transparency, lack of conflicts, and demonstrate expertise, that um, independent assurance really is independent. The next slide makes the point that um, actually bioethics is a subset of geoethics. Um, it's a subset of geoethics when the place of action and the place of effect converge on the same bodies. When uh, researchers do experiments on individuals, um, the place of the experiment and the place of the effect of the experiment is the same body, those research subjects or patients. With geoethics, geoethics the place of the activity, the creation of some type of dispersive nanotechnology, and the place of its effects may be dozens, hundreds, or thousands of miles away. Um, 
But it turns out that the two principles of geoethics subsume these four principles of bioethics, as the next slide shows. And um, you can see in the, the left-hand column here that uh, bioethics obtains consent from individuals who are weak and unable to negotiate terms. Uh, geoethics obtains consent from populations, not individuals, which provides greater negotiating strength. The requirements for beneficence and non-malfeasance help make up for the weak um, autonomy of any one individual against a research enterprise. But we don't really need beneficence and non-malfeasance for geoethics because a, a population with a independent scientific determination of whether there is a foreseeable a material and adverse harm, and independent legal determination of the adequacy of consent, um, all render redundant the need for independent uh, beneficence and malfeasance requirements. I mean, if people want to take a chance on um, nanotechnology and um, they have the information in front of them, we don't need to second guess whether or not that nanotechnology is actually beneficent or non-malfeasant. It's many things um, have aspects of both, uh, benefit and harm. If a population wants to take a chance on the benefit, uh, they should have the authority to do so. And under geoethics, they do have the authority to do so. Uh, the next slide uh, presents a, an idea for the formation of a society for accelerating geoethical advances in nanotechnology. Um, I would call this group SAGAN as an acronym. Um, it would either, um, it would be formed by a treaty and, and also scientific peer pressure. Um, scientific peer pressure is, is actually quite effective in getting other researchers to comply with what are considered to be reasonable norms. Uh, people want to get their work published, they want to get their work known, and scientists could agree, well, you've got to be working with Sagan, to get your work research, uh, your research published and known, presented and so forth. Actions involving nanotech would uh, first have to be cleared by Sagan, but Sagan itself uh, has to act in a very, um, Fractionary way. Um, I'm suggesting that it uh, must decide within 100 days if the proposed nanotech, quote, may foreseeably, materially, and adversely affect others. 100 days is uh, the clock which is used in Europe for uh, governments making decisions on mo moving forward with numerous medicines from one stage to the next stage. And since these medicines are life and death decisions for um, hundreds, even thousands of people, it seems if 100 days is enough for that, it, it should be enough to, to make a decision on whether or not nanotech um, foreseeably, materially, and adversely affects others. The next slide suggests some Sagan governing principles. Um, the first one would be if there's no scientific evidence of foreseeable material and adverse harm, then Sagan must authorize the proposed nanotech per the proactionary principle of Max Moore. So there's um, really no latitude to just sit on something over, you know, hypothetical um, and non-demonstrated risks of foreseeable um, material, foreseeable and adverse harm. On the other hand, if such harm is foreseeable, then Sagan must seek prior consent of affected populations via their representatives. So when C Sagan does see that, hey, there is a material risk of adverse harm, it's foreseeable based on the scientific data, then Sagan has the authority to stop um, the dispersive nanotech project from going forward um, until um, prior consent, consistent with legal overview, is obtained from the affected populations or their representatives. The next slide takes a look at what these consent procedures might be. Um, if um, national processes are available, uh, that would be great. That would work. 
Um, it would be consistent with respect for autonomy. We can't have every single person um, independently agreeing to everything. Um, majority voting seems to be good enough. Majority voting is enough for countries to um, to send themselves to war and incur all sorts of other risks that are probably far greater than dispersive nanotechnology. So majority voting should be um, good enough for consenting to um, uh, dispersive nanotech. If um, a place is, is not enough of democracy um, to provide assurance of uh, representative consent, I think that there are other options. Public opinion surveys are conducted um, in all kinds of countries around the world that are not normally considered democracies. Uh, public opinion surveys are, are scientific, plus or minus their, um, their um, measure of error. So I don't think like an actual vote is always necessary. A much more quickly implemented public opinion survey, I think would be an adequate measure of uh, consent. But if consent um, is not obtained, then the nanotech cannot cause risk in that geography because that would just not be fair. It would, uh, it would violate these cultural universals. Um, it would not be geoethical. So what then? How can some nanotech that's promising but harmful go forward? I'll get to that in a moment, but let me first talk about um, if consent is obtained, what would be the type of compliance procedures to ensure compliance with the terms of the consent? The consent may be, yes, we consent to uh, this dispersive nanotech uh, pouring over our borders, but we want there to be, you know, sampling stations put up at such and such locations, uh, serum sampling of the population, and such and such share in the benefits, just as an example. Well, the effector of nanotech must provide independent funding of the means of compliance with the terms of consent. Dr. Roth Blatt will return in a moment. I'm sure she just had a computer glitch. I think I'm back. I think I'm back. I think I'm back. I hear you. Cool. So, um, the uh, Sagan organization would ensure that there is independent funding to um, obtain compliance with the terms of consent. That could be done through an endowment that's part of the cost of the project. It could be done through user fees. Um, but it should be remembered, um, even by technology advocates, that the compliance organization has to have the authority to terminate the nanotech operations if the terms of consent are violated. So that gets us back again to the question of how can really exciting dispersive nanotech go forward that has a risk profile um, inconsistent with um, obtaining consent on the surface of the earth? I think the answer to that question was actually answered by Dr. Jerry O'Neill back in the 1970s when he first asked his physics class at Princeton um, is the surface of the earth the best place for a post-industrial civilization? And, and the answer was no, and he decided that the best place to carry out um, some really crazy self-replicating uh, technology were space habitats. So ultimately, actually I believe that uh, geoethics will help accelerate space industrialization because really exciting nanotech that um, just seems too dangerous to people 
to occur on the surface of the Earth would almost uh, surely uh, pass the uh, scientific test of uh, not foreseeably causing material harm if carried out in space. And certainly as one got deeper into space, the answer would be um, yes in every instance. And um, once there's no risk of uh, foreseeable material adverse harm, then there's no need to obtain consent of anybody. So um, not only does geoethics allow proactionary use of uh, nanotechnology on the Earth, um, protects people on Earth from unreasonable risks of harm, but accelerates our ultimate move into outer space as a place where just the wildest nanotech can run free. Um, that's the end of my talk, and happy to answer any questions. Um, one, uh, Mihal is um, suggesting, Mihal is suggesting, Mihal is suggesting that we could dump it into the sun. Um, let's see. Eshatun is suggesting. Eshatun is suggesting that. I completely agree I completely with, agree with um, um, uh, I'll just type it sounds like somebody else's mic is on. Um, I agree with Eshatun. I agree with Eshatun that um, it's also a good honor to Carl Sagan. Question from uh, Fleddy is, um, is 
how to achieve separation, how to determine the amount of separation necessary to not affect any areas that do not want to participate. I think that's a, uh, a scientific question that um, would be addressed by a panel of scientists who are competent in the field as accurately as possible. Uh, Philippe asks, how could Sagan have the respect of powers to be to see its rulings are implemented, executed, and respected? Um, a great way is to, is to get the uh, nanotechnology engineers, scientists, um, of all sorts, whether um, in the field of uh, molecular biology or material science, to themselves uh, support SAGEN. Uh, peer pressure is often stronger than government rulings. Uh, Extropia asks, what lessons have we learned from the public's distaste of uh, GMO? Basically, that the parts of the world that don't like GMO uh, suffer from having more expensive and scarcer food, and the parts of the world that do like GMO get cheaper and better food. So I think we'll just let cultural evolution end up swinging the pendulum over in favor of GMO. Uh, Mayback asks, will with something on the other side of the black hole via nanotech, um, who knows? Oh, Mayback says, uh, will nanotech tell us what's behind the black holes, as in will we be able to communicate? I don't know. Uh, Uh, Philippe, I absolutely positively will. Uh, thank you for that offer. Um, the answer is definitely yes. Thanks, Mayback. Well, with um, no uh, further questions, I would like to go ahead and uh, call the formal meeting, formal part of the uh, eighth um, workshop on geoethical nanotechnology to a close. We now will have uh, the balance of time and another half hour for informal interactions amongst each other. As in all conferences, some of the greatest discussions occur when people talk one to each other, one to one. So um, have at it. Thank you very much for your participation. And most of all, everybody, please join me in giving a round, wa uh, round of applause to Lori Darling for her fantastic organizational efforts for this meeting. Lori, thank you. I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I will remain in world uh, until the last person leaves the conference center in case anyone has any questions about TerraSEM or its missions uh, or projects. <laughs>